Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Most of us spend many hours of our day looking down, looking down at screens, looking down at phones, looking down at work. But what I would like to invite you to do as we start this morning is to do something a little bit unusual. I want you to look up, not at me. I want you to look up there, look up at the ceiling, look up at this great vaulted expanse that is up over us. And I want you to notice these arches and the flowers and these angels at the top of each arch and just think about what perhaps this might be symbolizing. All right, you can look back down. I don't want you to get a crick in your neck. One of the things that we often forget is that particularly when this church was first built in 1723, and was built at this exact same height that people who lived in Charleston in the 1720s were used to buildings that were small and ceilings that were low. And if you came into a house, you might normally find a seven-foot ceiling, occasionally an eight-foot ceiling, but nothing anywhere close to this. St. Philip's was by far the tallest building in town inside and outside. And part of the reason for that is that the theology of the English Reformation and of the founders of the church, going all the way back to Jesus' time and indeed even into the Old Testament, was that we are living out our lives under the vault of heaven. And that we are to remember always that we are living under the vault of heaven, and that there is a whole realm of spiritual beings, principalities, and powers who are at work uh, in the heavenlies and on this earth. And that is part of the reason that we have these angels at the top to remind us. And as you look forward toward the altar, you see that heaven moves down and intersects with earth at the altar there. And it is a reminder that in Jesus, that is where these two realities find their union. The great English theologian N.T. Wright gave a brilliant talk at Mere Anglicanism several years ago about this topic of the vault of heaven. And I want to just share part of what he said with you. He said, the biblical heaven and earth overlap and intersect. The life of the world to come, in which God shall make all things new, breaks into this world, and we are to live as citizens of the kingdom which is coming while we are in the kingdoms of this world. The church has too often colluded with secularism by letting God be pushed upstairs out of sight into a split-level universe. This idea from which secularism springs actually comes from Epicurus, the Greek philosopher, who said, if the gods exist at all, it is far away. They take no notice of us. If there is no serious commerce between earth and heaven, then God is out of the picture and humans can control the earth and their own destiny without fear of divine judgment. But the Bible tells us that heaven and earth are not entirely separate entities, but overlap and interlock in serious and vital ways. In the temple in the Old Testament, heaven and earth meet. In the same way, in the church, heaven and earth meet as you enter the presence of God. That great hymn that we just sang, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence, is a hymn from the liturgy of St. James that has been sung by Christians since the 400s, for 1,600 years. And it talks about the fact that God's reality in heaven comes down and intersects with our reality. And this is something that is so important. And today's epistle from the Ephesians is an important reminder that contrary to what Madonna sings about, we do not live only in a material world. We live in a world where there are spiritual forces, both of good and of evil, that are at work impacting and intersecting our lives and the course of history. 
Yet in the midst of all of these forces, God is sovereign, and Christ has triumphed by his death and resurrection. The battle may still be going on, but we know that the war has been won because our enemy was defeated at the cross. But Christ and his death and resurrection has revealed the plan of mystery hidden for ages and God's eternal purpose. So this morning, what I want us to do is to walk through the first part of this passage, and I would invite you to turn to the Ephesians passage in your bulletin. Sometime when you have time, sit down and read the whole epistle to the Ephesians at one sitting. It is a brilliant and beautiful work that will really bless you. But as we look at this passage this morning, we're going to look at three questions What is the mystery that Paul is talking about? What is the purpose of God? And why does it matter for us today? So first, let's walk through the first 13 verses here and see what Paul is saying. So Paul is coming to this chapter right after having talked in the previous chapter about the glory of God and the way that we have been brought all together through Jesus Christ. And he says that he has been given the stewardship of God's grace about this mystery, this mystery that was made known by revelation. That is, it was revealed to him from God. It was not his supposition or his intellect. It was shown him by God through the Holy Spirit. And this mystery of Christ was not made known to the sons of men and other generations But now it has been revealed by his holy apostles, that is revealed to Jesus' apostles who followed this light of light who descended into our world. And through them and to them, this mystery was revealed. And that mystery is that the Gentiles, the nations, everyone who's not Jewish, they are all partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ. And Paul is made a minister to carry this gospel message to them. And this gospel, Paul takes to preach to those who are outside Israel, who are not Jewish, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And for that to be a light on this plan of the mystery hidden for ages that shows God's eternal purpose. So that through the church, this manifold wisdom might be revealed not just to us, but to the spiritual forces of good and evil that exist in this world and in the heavenly places, and that the result of that might be the glory of God. So there's a lot in there, and we're going to try to unpack that a little bit. So first, looking at what is the mystery. So a mystery, by definition, is something we don't understand. It's something that um, is curious to us that maybe we don't have full information. If it's a who done it, um, we're trying to figure out who is the one that had the weapon, like in Clue, uh, trying to figure out who did it. But the mystery that Paul is talking about here is a mystery that has been hidden from the foundations of the world. And he says that that mystery is that the Gentiles, the nations, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, part of the reason that this is a mystery is all through ancient history, known throughout the world, was that the Jews were a people set apart. They were God's own possession. They were the people who possessed the covenant promises. And all those who were outside, all of those who were Gentiles, which is most of us, unless you're of Jewish heritage, were outside these promises. Now, there were little hints scattered along through the Old Testament and the promise to Abraham and in other places that somehow God was going to do something about the Gentiles. But what happens is that we see in Jesus Christ and through Paul that every tribe and every language and every race and every nation is invited to come to Jesus Christ. And this mystery happens through the gospel. 
Now, Paul defines what the gospel is several times, but I think most clearly in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to what he says. Now, I would remind you of the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And you'll notice there that there's something repeated in accordance with the Scriptures. And what Paul is saying is that the gospel is the good news that God sent his son to die on the cross for us, to redeem us from our sins through his blood in the way that the scriptures promised that Christ was dead, that his life had departed from him, and he was dead and in the tomb. But through the miraculous power of God that created the world, God brought Jesus back to life resurrected him, and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. This is the gospel, and it is in that mystery of the Jews and the Gentiles together hearing this great good news about what God has done that we find the answer to this mystery. The crucifixion is not what the world would say was wisdom. In fact, Paul says elsewhere that it is Christ crucified is foolishness to many people in the world. But he says, for us, it is the power of God for salvation. And it is God's wisdom. When the Messiah died on the cross, what he did through his resurrection was to create a new people, the church, the church with a capital C, all of those who, regardless of background, whether Jew or Gentile, Greek, woman, man, any race, everyone who came to faith in Jesus Christ became a new body, part of this new creation, the church. And it is out of the church that the manifold wisdom of God shines brightly to this world. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the mystery is that all nations all people, both Jew and Gentile, are included in the riches of salvation accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross through his death and resurrection. And that free gift is offered to us. So that brings us to the second question, what is God's purpose in this? And Paul tells us in this passage, he says his intent, God's intent was that now through the church, that new body, which includes all of us sitting here today, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. And not made known just to other people, but made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ. Angels and spiritual powers, both holy and unholy, witness the glory of God and the preeminence of Christ through what God has done in Christ on the cross and through the resurrection, being shown the wisdom and purpose of God where he is putting into action this plan of salvation. Now, Ephesians, especially if you read through the whole thing, is one of the strongest books in Scripture that takes seriously the fact that we are not walking around on what you might call a level playing field, that there are spiritual forces that are at work. And when you read through Ephesians, you see that. Now, in our Western culture, we don't like that idea. We're very rational people, and we think that sounds superstitious and backwards. But the fact of the matter is that even in the 21st century, most people around the world do believe in spiritual forces of good and evil. One of my favorite examples of this is that um, not too long ago, the Chinese government passed a law forbidding people to reincarnate in certain provinces. So that belief is alive and well, and we need to reclaim not the belief in reincarnation, but the belief that there are spiritual forces that are at work. It reminds me a little bit of a play that if you are of a certain age like I am, um, you have almost certainly studied this play in high school. And that play, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Thornton Wilder, is a play called Our Town. 
And if you are a younger person, I would commend to you to read that play. But what you see in that play is a play within a play where we're looking at the lives of people in the small town of Grover's Corners. And so there are different times where we sort of parachute in and look at what's going on in their lives over a period of decades. But things don't always, when you go into that first section, you think you know what's going to happen next, and you get 10 years later in the play, and it's not at all what you thought. And what you learn in the play is there is this curious character in the play called the stage manager. And he knows things that none of the people in Grover's Corners know. He knows about the future. He knows what's going to happen. And sometimes he does things that change the course of what's happening in the play. And that's a little bit about what we're talking about here, that God is present and real, and there are spiritual forces, both good and bad, that are impacting what is going on in the world. The great scholar R.C. Sproul had this to say about God's purpose here. He said, it is easy to believe the Lord's primary purpose in saving his people is to bless us. We readily view salvation as man-centered, and we often regard our own well-being, our own well-being as God's chief concern. In other words, that he's in business to make me happy. Certainly, we must not discount God's amazing and eternal love for us. But Paul has the same God-centered view of salvation, not a man-centered view. He says that the whole purpose of what's going on in our redemption is making the glory of God known throughout the creation in the heavens and on the earth. That God is showing something to the spiritual forces through what is happening. And this whole creation of the church who are entrusted with this gospel to proclaim, the purpose of that Paul says in verse 10 is to proclaim the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And that word manifold is a really glorious word in the Greek. It's a word that is normally used to describe the most beautiful tapestry or embroidery that you could imagine with layer on layer on layer of intricate and beautiful pattern that you can look at for hours and see more and more and more beauty as you gaze at it. And he says that is what God's manifold wisdom is like that is being declared through what he did in Jesus Christ. The church does not exist simply for the purpose of saving souls, though that is a marvelous and important work. The church is to testify to the glory of God showing a supernatural unity in Christ where people of every tribe and tongue and nation are united in following Jesus. Now this is so important because it tells us that the universe itself has a purpose. It's not just here because it's beautiful or interesting. The universe is here to declare the glory of God. So we see in Psalm 19, the heavens are declaring the glory of God, and they are pouring forth speech day after day about the glory of God. But the problem for us is that sometimes we get stuck, and we think that it is all about us. And in fact, it is not all about us. We are rescued so that we can become rescuers. So God's purpose is that the church, all of these people brought together, will do something that could never have happened just with Israel. What the church does is to break down every barrier. And this is part of the reason that the Roman Empire was so very threatened when Christianity started to spread. Because the Roman Empire was a very stratified society. Up at the top, 
were people who were Roman citizens, and at the top of those people were people who were senators and proconsuls and generals. And then you had regular citizens, and then you had rich people who were not citizens, middle class people who were not citizens, and then people of other nations, and then slaves who were the lowest of the low. And this society was so stratified that those people never mixed with one another. But when Jesus Christ and his gospel hit the Roman Empire, the world turned upside down because suddenly you might have a Roman senator and a Jewish slave who were in the same fellowship breaking bread at communion together and calling each other brother and sister was turning the systems of the world and Rome on its head. And the Romans decided this needed to be stamped out and stamped out quickly because it was too threatening. The unity that we have in Jesus Christ with other believers across race and across background and across economic things, that unity is something that we should be showing to the world because it declares the power of God to this broken and hurting world when we do that. So this brings us to our last question. Why does all of this theology about these things matter today? And the reason that it matters is that Paul here is telling us about these heavenly rulers and authorities, and he may be thinking about the fact that there are some, Satan and his demons, who have gone bad. But the creation of the church shows forth God's glory to these people because of the shocking unity of Jew and Gentile, that shocking, impossible by worldly standards, unity of people that are brought together by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the interesting thing about this is that they don't see, these spiritual forces don't see the glory and wisdom of God just in the cross and what was accomplished there, or even in the resurrection and what was accomplished there, but in us, in the church, this is a profound and great mystery itself that God uses his creation, the church, to show forth his glory in the world. God rescues us that we might become rescuers. We have not been rescued that we might sit on the deck of the salvation yacht and take it easy. No, we are instead to be people that are on the lifeboats, who are pulling people in with life rafts and life vests, showing them that the only hope for this broken world is in this great wisdom and glory that is made manifest in who Jesus is. We have been restored so that we can be restorers. Those who are pointing to truth and beauty and goodness in the midst of a world that has gone wrong. Truty, truth, beauty, and goodness that point toward the gospel as the great fulfillment and God's eternal purpose. And by doing that, the church helps hold back these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, the false gospel of secularism, the false gospel of individualism, the false gospel of narcissism, and that I am the captain of my own soul. All of that false gospel is held at bay when we radically follow Jesus Christ. My friends, we are to live the gospel out not as a private club hidden away from the world and demanding an admission ticket, but as a public reality that challenges the world to see itself in a new way, that challenges individuals to see themselves not as hopeless creatures filled with anxiety that emerged out of some primal goo with no purpose or meaning and are no different from a blade of grass that perishes, but instead as beloved creations made in the image of a loving God who made you with gifts and purpose so that you might be part of this glorious plan and this manifold beautiful tapestry that he is weaving. The church should hold the principalities and powers of this world to account by sharing this beautiful vision over and over and over again. Secularism wants to pressure us to be quiet, 
to have a private gospel and a private spirit and an escapist salvation. But my friends, that is nowhere in the words of the New Testament. It is nowhere in Jesus' words. We are to boldly go like Star Trek where no man has gone before. We are to boldly proclaim this gospel because it is the truth and it is a mystery no longer. It has been hidden for ages, but it is ours to declare to this broken and hurting world. So to sum up, let us hold fast and give thanks to God for the mystery of his incredible love in Jesus Christ that brings all people, regardless of background or race or their original religion, it brings all of us the opportunity of salvation. Let us proclaim with boldness God's eternal purpose to draw all people to himself in the church, this new body that he has created, not following but challenging the wisdom of this world and the spiritual forces of evil by radically choosing to follow Jesus and his word. And let us remember that we are not alone. One of the beautiful things in the prophecies that we hear in Advent each year is that Jesus, one of his names is Emmanuel, God with us. That he comes out of that heavenly realm to be with us, to walk with us as we seek to proclaim him. Let us always remember that we are not alone in a world that is left alone by God, but that we are under this vault of heaven that we are under his care, and that we are surrounded by his love. As we close today, I invite you to close your eyes and reflect with me on this last stanza of a hymn we will sing later in this service that proclaims a truth that we should remember every day. Let us pray. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let the heavens reign. God reigns. Let earth be glad. May it be so. Amen.